In today's programme, we listen to the buzz about ecology. You're listening to The Science Show on Cambridge 105. In this section called Scientists at Work, we talk to people who, for some reason or another, find themselves working, researching or thinking about science in Cambridge, England. It's a big welcome back to Chris, who's just returned from the Ecological Society of America conference. She's arrived back scanned, searched and cleared by customs. Hey, Chris, what interesting people did you meet over there? At the conference, I met one of the world's leading scientists on critical transitions. And if you don't know what those are, don't worry, Martin Sheffer will explain shortly. He also helped make a film on the subject, and we're going to find out more about that from him a little bit later. So, Chris, with all the work to prepare for your own talk at the Ecological Society of America conference, how did you manage to meet this Martin Sheffer? I mean, he is the big guy, isn't he? He is. He's an incredible scientist, author, now filmmaker. And believe it or not, Roger, I actually met him at a movie. You see, Mm -hmm. us ecologists, we're a pretty eclectic group of scientists with all sorts of different talents. And Martin happens to be a musician who also wrote the score for this movie, Critical Transitions, that premiered at the beginning of the ESA conference. But before we get too much into the movie, I started by asking Martin about what he does when he wears his scientist cap. I'm a biologist studying ecosystems. I'm an ecosystem scientist. And one of my uh, lines of work has been to study the stability of ecosystems. Um, In the beginning, that was mainly lakes. And one of the interesting properties of lakes is that they can suddenly flip to a contrasting state. They can from clear become turbid in a short time and then it's very difficult to get them back. It's almost like uh, pushing a chair over and then it's difficult to get it back. It's a flip-flop between uh, what we call alternative stable states. And um, then we realize that this is actually a property that you see in many more uh, complex systems. For instance, aspect of the climate uh, system have that Uh, but also society, for instance. Um, So some of the uh, dramatic changes we see in the world appear to have this tipping point issue in in, in the background. Um, So you could think of the financial crisis or the Arab Spring when it comes to society. And uh, I am mainly working with uh, a combination of mathematical techniques uh, and experimental work to try to figure out those, uh, those properties of systems that can flip from one state to the other. And we have questions like, can we somehow predict whether a system becomes brittle in the sense that a small push can create such a flip to another state, so early warning signal, so to say. Um, also, we have a lot of work in which we try to see if we can intentionally flip systems from one state to the other. For instance, in the case of the lakes, um, we've really figured out all the mechanisms that are behind the screens there, and uh, we found ways to flip a turbid lake back to a clear state. So that's one application. And ag- again, you can think of that application in other contexts. For instance, uh, the poverty trap can be an, an alternative stable state for a family or a, or a community, a state in which they have uh, so little resources that they cannot invest in, in, in education or in things to buy to, to create a small business. So that's a stable state. But in some cases, that stable state can be brittle enough that you can perturb it, like a shock therapy, so that people escape from that poverty trap and go to a more wealthy state and uh, the perturbation in this case is usually giving a micro credit so a Nobel Prize has been given for that idea and it works pretty well so it, it's really interesting that there is a kind of universality in this kind of uh, work on, uh, on tipping points Very interesting and how would you define an alternative stable state for us? Well an alternative stable state uh, is a system has alternative stable states if for the same external conditions it can be in either of the contrasting states. For instance, for the lake, uh, the main factor that determines whether it's clear or turbid is, uh, is, is the nutrient uh, load of the lake, the fertilizer load, so to say. But there is a range of fertilizer loads where a lake can be either clear or 
turbot. And this is because there are uh, feedbacks, positive feedbacks, that can push the system towards one state or, or the other. For instance, once uh, a system is uh, turbid, but it becomes a little bit more clear, um, the lake water is transparent enough that you have enough light for plants to grow on the bottom of the lake. And when the, the plants start growing, they actually help clearing the water. So this creates a positive feedback that can create a, a runaway change towards a, a more stable, clear state. So why would we want to potentially flip an environmental stable state into a different stable state? Well, if you put it simply, those contrasting states, uh, you, you can often find one to be more favorable than the other. Well, that's a simplification because some people actually like a turbid lake because a turbid lake has lots of big carp and they love to fish carp. See, it, it's not often very clear cut. But in other cases, um, like the poverty trap, everybody would agree that that's nice to have people out, people out of the top poverty trap, for instance, and, and a financially collapsed system is not very nice. So often you can think that there is one state that's better for most people than the other state, and then you'll be interested in trying to see how you could flip a system that is trapped into an unwanted state back to a, a more favorable condition. So your research is trying to figure out a way to predict when we'll see these shifts into a different stable state and also understanding the conditions that are involved with particular stable states? Yes. <clears throat> Prediction is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the application, in the end you want to prevent bad flips and you want to stimulate good flips. So uh, if you think of preventing bad flips, then one of the aspects is to, to figure out which systems are actually becoming vulnerable and then maybe you can do something there. Or when you turn it around, if you're interested in creating good flips, you're interested in which badly trapped systems are actually vulnerable in the sense that a little effort may be enough to flip them out of that state with the shock therapy. So when I say, say shock therapy, you might, you might, it might remind you of, of also like uh, psychiatric problems that people have. And actually, that is also one of the fields we're working now very actively in. We're working in medical uh, sciences now a lot. We're doing research on uh, migraine onset. We're doing research on uh, psychiatric uh, disorders, uh, other uh, medical disorders. And, and again, there you see basically the same system properties that can mathematically be described in the same way and have like a kind of generic aspects uh, to them. So one of the things that I really like about this kind of research is that it helps you bridge between disciplines. So you can suddenly bring together people that work on, on depression in humans and people that work on lakes, uh, and they actually have something in common to talk about and they can learn from each other. That, that's pretty amazing and, and very exciting, I think. It's wonderful to see how broadly applied ecological research can be. And speaking of broadly applied, you actually premiered a movie at the Ecological Society of America conference called Critical Transitions. Now tell us about that and your involvement in it. One of the things I'm, I'm really interested in is to try to cooperate between scientists and non-scientists. I think that is, that, that's for, from, from all sides, that can be very beneficial because as a scientist you're, you're very good at focusing at particular things, defining well-defined questions that can be answered. But actually, as, as some people say, science is in a way creating islands of insights into a sea of ignorance in the sense that we're asking only a very limited number of questions. You could ask many more questions. We never even think of them. They don't come to our mind because we're in a way blinded by the things we do know. And it can be really nice to, to interact and discuss your science and your ideas with people that are really from other disciplines in science but also outside science and artists are a particularly interesting group because in a way they're like scientists they're trying to capture the essence of uh, 
uh, of an aspect of this complex world in, in, in a very good way. And also, just like scientists there, they, they have to do that in an original way. They have to be new and original. So in a way, we're in the same boat, but they come from a completely different angle. So I think it's really interesting to work with artists and also you know, artists have the, often have the capacity to speak to a much broader audience than scientists. So if you think of a good novel or a good movie, it reaches much more people than, than science. And scientists are often a bit like, uh, they don't listen to us, they don't understand this and all that. So I think also from that perspective, it's nice to work together with other people. Uh, and, and especially with, with artists when it comes to capturing the essence of certain aspects. So I, I made this movie uh, with uh, Tuna Bjordam. Uh, uh, she, um, she has done a lot of work, abstract, like moving uh, paintings, I would say. You have to look up her website to really appreciate what she's, what she's doing. I ran into her work in a museum in, in, in Stockholm and it really stuck with me. I really liked that work. And um, I contacted her to ask if she would be interested to do something together. And um, uh, she read uh, the book I wrote, Critical Transitions in Nature and, and, and Society, and uh, liked it. And uh, then I, I went over to her place. We discussed for one week uh, the science, but also different angles at uh, looking at tipping points and critical transitions. And then... Um, thought about a storyboard for the movie and then she, she made a, a, what I find a really beautiful movie about that and, uh, and since I'm uh, half a scientist, half a musician I couldn't resist uh, offering to make the soundtrack and she, she accepted that and uh, it has really become a common project uh, in that sense um, and um, so that, that, that's the story behind that movie and what for me is very uh, very nice is that the movie is not just an illustration of the science, it really uh, emphasizes other aspects of the critical transitions. For instance, that the transition from one phase to the other is often very chaotic and turbulent, and that uh, even when you're getting into that phase of transition, it's often very difficult to realize you're in that phase, because things are always changing. So how do you realize you're actually in the middle of a transition that changes the world forever? Um, so I think she captured, captured it really nicely in the movie and, and, and it was a really nice project to do together. That's wonderful. And what do you think is one of the most pressing critical transitions that we're going to face <coughs> this generation? Well, that's hard to say, we, but we are definitely in a really interesting time for people that study change like, like, like I do. The climate is changing, society is changing, the way we communicate is changing uh, with social media and, and, and the internet. There is a lot of pressure on the planet, but there is also a lot of sources of innovation and, and communication uh, between people. So uh, I, I, I don't want to like make a list of all the bad things that can happen that, that, that can be critical transitions like flips in the climate system like the Indian monsoon collapsing and millions of people dying of hunger or uh, pandemics evolving. Or many bad transitions can happen but on the good side of transitions uh, there can be novel uh, uh, inventions, novel ways uh, changes in the mindset of people that can be really rapid through, through the way we communicate now that I'm also uh, optimistic about. So we're standing at the precipice of a lot of change and we have an opportunity as a society, as a species, to make a choice with this predictive power from these models we might be able to actually choose how to flip into a particular stable state and we can choose a more positive future. We're starting to understand these things uh, better and better in, in, in a pretty fast rate now, I would say, yes. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for spending time with us today, Martin. Welcome. Many thanks to Martin Sheffer. We'll put links on our website to that provocative film called Critical Transitions, which comes from a collaboration between Martin and the artist Tone Bjordam, and a link to Martin's book called Critical Transitions in Nature and Society. So you might want to check those things out. That's pretty much all for today's show. Scientists at Work is made by the Science Show team on Community Radio, Cambridge 105. 
You can also find past episodes on the website www.cambridge105.fm. You can also subscribe to future podcasts with the iTunes store. You can get in touch with us on the email science at cambridge105.fm or on Twitter at 105science. Till next time, it's bye from the Science Show team of Roger Frost and Chris Kreese. You're listening to The Science Show on Cambridge 105.